So I've opened a can of worms. This can of worms is called JPEGs. JP pictures. And this can of worms. Look at look at all this. Look at all this. Look at all this. has caused me to just go mad with printing. And JPEGs. Essentially, I've gone mad. The last, the last week, all I've been thinking about JPEGs for some reason. It's it's crazy. Why would a, a person do that? Um, yet yeah, that is what I did, and I I need to just bear my soul to you and and share what I've learned because otherwise I'm just gonna go even more mad. If you want settings or to know the best settings for exporting to JPEG, then I can, can divulge wisdom that I've gained recently. And uh, that is the whole point of this video. So please uh, get a drink. Um, I've got a, a cup of coffee, black coffee. Um, you can get tea, maybe a, a G&T if you wish, depending on the time of day. Um, go get that. Come, uh, just remember to pause the video first pause the video, get the drink and a snack if you wish, um, that's up to you, I'm not going to judge you for having a snack and a drink while watching this, um, I just want you to be comfortable and really be in a position to, to take in this information that uh, uh, hopefully will come across in an in a informative way and not just some dribble from a, a dribbly guy, um, but yeah, so JPEGs, at the end, I'll cover some settings or recommendations for export settings. Um, uh, but we're going to look into color space, bit depth, DPI, um, 8 bit, 16 bit, um, just a variety of things that can uh, make us go a bit confused about the whole JPEG thing. And that's why we just don't touch it and let Lightroom just just export at default settings, but are they the best settings? Yeah, that quality slider, that's an interesting one. To begin this journey of of JPEGs, uh, let's, let's just start with a JPEG. What is a JPEG? What, why do we use JPEGs? Let's get into that once you've got your drink. So basically, the JPEG is a way to store data in a smaller file size. Uh, what it does, it essentially goes through the image and decides what is actually needed and what isn't. And it deletes, completely removes any information you don't need and just retains the information you do need to just keep what you need to see. You know, no hidden information. So that's why it can reduce so much file size. Plus then it has algorithms and maths to compress that data even more. So essentially that's what a JPEG does. Actually there's some really good videos on YouTube about explaining the actual process and algorithms of how a JPEG works. It's very interesting. Uh, I'll link them below in the description for you to, you know, take in more information or just something extra to watch. So JPEG is known as a lossy format. That's because information that's not needed, it throws away. It's lost, as it were. Um, then you have files such as a raw file or a TIFF file. These are known as lossless because uh, they don't remove or delete any data. They contain all the information still. Uh, they just perhaps put it in a different format so that other programs and software can read it easier, perhaps. Uh, but essentially all the data is retained and that's why then TIFF files are so, so large. So going back to the JPEG, we, we use this because, you know, it's so accessible for everyone. It's universally used. Every computer uses it. Every phone uses it. It's decent small manageable file sizes and it's just everyone uses it so 
and because everyone uses it, everyone uses it. So JPEGs is the way forward. It's life. Hashtag that JPEG life. But when it comes to exporting files, once we've edited our pictures, we it's kind of we don't really think past that. We just export it, and I'm sure most of us just use the default export settings on Lightroom or uh, Photoshop, whatever you use, and um, we're happy with that. But why? Why are we happy with that? Surely there's more to life than just the default settings in Lightroom. Surely. But there is. There's light at the end of the tunnel, and it's called JPEG Mini. JPEG Mini is the basis for this video. It's what got me overthinking about a file format. I mean, who does it? I keep seeing adverts and people talking about this software called JPEG Mini. Now, as a wedding photographer, I have hundreds and thousands of images that I have to uh, export into JPEG and they take up a, a valuable chunk of, of hard disk space. JPEG Mini it seems to be a solution to cut that space down even more. You basically take your JPEGs, put them through the software, it crunches numbers, it it does sciencey things, pumps out the other end your file, but with smaller file sizes. Seems like a win-win, doesn't it? I downloaded the free trial and uh, I was testing it with a variety of different um, JPEGs. I had some old ones, some new ones, and uh, I found uh, an interesting mixture of results. Now, some JPEGs, it would really cut down the size. It would make a good chunk of difference. But then other JPEGs barely made a dent in the, in reducing the file size. And I, I didn't understand. Why would it work for some and not for others? And, you know, is there a limit to the capabilities of this software? that I potentially am looking to pay money for. Let's go into the darkest, deepest deeps of JPEG. Let's delve into JPEG Mini. What does it say it actually does? The website loads very nicely and quickly. It's, a, it's a, the benefit. Um, technology. Okay, we found it. It's not simple to find. Um, JPEG Mini is a patented photo compression technology which significantly reduces the size of photographs without affecting their perceptual quality. Interesting term there, perceptual quality. JPEG Mini is capable of reducing the file size of a standard JPEG photos by up to 80%, five times. While the resulting photos are visually identical to the original photos. Well, that, that's perfect, isn't it? Win, win. Smaller size, same quality. Let's get this software running and um, see what it can do. Here, the original file for this was a TIFF and it was like, where is it? 199,000 kilobytes or 99 meg. And um, and then I've outputted various JPEGs as part of my rigorous JPEG testing, quality testing uh, standards, which probably wouldn't be upheld by any kind of um, body. This is just very weak research. And we're going to take uh, a copy of uh, this file, uh, paste it back in there. So this file is 35 and a half megabytes. It is a hundred percent full size JPEG of this this image here, the lovely old man of store in the Isle of Sky, which if you've never been, you should go. Beautiful, was up at 2 a.m. to get this picture, and it was a, a fairly nice sunrise. So let's take that copy through here and see if it does anything. Oh, it's doing. There we go. So now it's pumped it out. It is now 10, nearly 11 megabytes. It's saying it's 25 megabytes saved. Amazing. That is incredible, isn't it? 25 whole megabytes saved and perceptively no different. Let's uh, switch between them. So that's the original 
there. And then the copy which has been run through JPEG Mini and I agree it looks exactly the same. But wait, there's more. What happens when I take an image that's been exported at zero percent quality and run that through? How much uh, space is that going to save? A file that is gone from 100 megabytes exported to JPEG uh, just over 3 megabytes. Let's make a copy of that one. Paste that. So I'll take the copy, run that through and we'll see if that saves us anything. I think it's done. Yes, it's done. Zero megabytes saved. So essentially it's done nothing to that file. Um, assume it's the same quality. Yes, that's the same one. It's the original one. And um, perceptively the same. I mean, agree about that. Uh, it just hasn't compressed it anymore. Um, so that is interesting. So this is where the can of worms open. So I'm getting different results. Why is that? Well, you will find out in due course. You just got to keep with if it. Hopefully, you still got snacks and and coffee, and that's that's still going. So my test for JPEG Mini, and and my thinking is, well, if I've taken a a 35 megabyte file. And JPEG Mini's reduced it, to, reduced it to 10 megabytes. Well, how does that compare to if, as if I just exported the original file uh, with a quality setting that resulted in a 10 megabit file in the first place? Would there be any perceptible difference? And this is where we started getting deeper because I started printing. Look at all these. They have the same image. They're from here, from this image, and I've just blown them up as if I'm printing a like 70 by 50 uh, image at various qualities. I've also been comparing on the computer at various qualities. In fact, let's uh, start to delve into that. So we are in uh, Capture One, which is my preferred uh, editing software. Let's see if there's any noticeable difference. And at 100% on my screen, I mean, I, I'm just recreating this for you. I've spent ages looking at this, but essentially they look no different. Let's go to 400%. It's the most subtle differences at this point. Between the original TIFF and the 100% they look exactly the same except I would say you can see some extremely subtle artifacting. But compared to the JPEG mini version and the 80% quality version, again these look amazing, super high quality. The only subtle differences would be noise compared to or artifacting compared to this is actually been kind of smoothed out but because it's been smoothed out this mountain edge doesn't have the quite defined edge um, that the original and 100% do they're just slightly more smoothed off but just so subtly we can see artifacting around the edge uh, one thing about JPEG when you compress it when it comes to like text and edges it's not perfect at all. But yeah, I would say like the JPEG Mini and the Capture One just look to me just the same. Exactly the same at 400%. If they look exactly the same at 400%, they're going to look exactly the same at 100% or 50% or whatever. This graph shows exports of qualities 100 down to 0 from Capture One, Photoshop and Lightroom. And in the lighter colours, once them exports have been put through a JPEG Mini. Now you'll notice that once you hit below about 80% quality, the further compression that JPEG Mini does is basically nothing. So from 100 to 80, it does do compression, but anything below that, it really, really doesn't. 
So my conclusion regarding JPEG Mini as a program to use. Um, actually, I think it has a real benefit. That's very like Prime Minister. It has a real benefit in that um, if you've got old pictures from old point and shoots, old cameras, anything that you wouldn't have had the original RAW file for. So if you've got loads of old pictures like that on your hard drive, and I'm sure like me you've got hundreds if not thousands of old pictures sitting there, it actually makes a massive difference in, in reducing the uh, file sizes without losing any quality. So for that application, I think this program is amazing. Where it falls down is if you've got the original raw file or a high quality TIFF that you can then export a JPEG um, with. You might as well export at just a lower quality setting on the slider and then you wouldn't have to purchase and use uh, this software. So it swings and roundabouts with this but for me, for my use, uh, for weddings and things like that, I, I feel zero need to use it. I'm just going to reduce the quality of the slider and get exactly the same results as if I put it uh, through this software. So that is JPEG Mini. For those who have wondered about it, that's uh, hopefully giving you an idea if you, if you should get it or not. But wait, there's more. The quality slider. That it's it's uh uh the quality slider. Well, let's get an example. Quality slider. This thing here. How much, 0 to 100, how much difference does it make to actual quality? Well, let's, let's go into that. My uh, method for testing the quality slider was to produce uh, multiple JPEGs of, um, I've got three different images, a nice portrait of me, a wedding uh, situation, and obviously this uh, this lovely landscape that we've we've viewed already to export those three files two raw one tiff in different differentiating qualities so starting at 100 90 80 70 60 50 40 30 20 10 and 0 and then just literally printing and comparing on the screen so let me get a selection for you to to view for yourself. Obviously, YouTube in itself is going to compress this footage. So what you're seeing isn't going to be as good quality as what I can see for myself because there's going to be compression between me recording this and you viewing it, even in 4K. But hopefully it gives you an idea of uh, the difference in quality it can make. Okay, here we go. Let's zoom in at 100% to my favourite little part of the picture. Here we would see the biggest difference because we got the lowest qu quality export and the original TIFF. The differences are, you can see a bit of artefacting artifacting around the edges. The ridges of these mountains aren't as smooth, they're a little bit pixelated. And then any fine detail in the shadows between these mountains and things just looks a bit mushy. That's at 100%. I mean, if we were going to view this at 50%, say, there's no discernible difference. 67%, uh, you can start to see pixelating and like blockiness. 400%, look at that. Can we see the differences now? Look at the original compared to this. Look, there's just pure blocks. Edge of mountain is just not very well defined. We go back up to the 100%, nice definition, and we can see as we come down the ver the varying qualities how more blocky and less defined that edge is as you can see even at 90 percent a little bit of artifacting around the edges there and then that just kind of gets worse slowly bit by bit just kind of depends what distance you're viewing it from so this is just comparing the quality slider settings what though if I exported the uh, image, which is 7,700 odd pixels, reduced it to something that was more like 3,600 pixels or 1,600 pixels, how would that affect quality, file size, and, and a, ver a varying combination of things like that? That's what I've done. 
I've exported these at uh, full size 3600 pixels at 1600 pixels so for example if we take the lowest quality full size image what would that be like if we compared exporting the file at 3600 so that's almost half the amount of pixels but a higher quality which has the similar file size does that make a difference well let's compare that at 50 percent there is literally no difference in quality looks looks fine to me 67 percent but at what is 200% on the 3600 one and 100% on that which will result in a similar size image obviously the full size one looks sharper I would say like the mountain edges look more pixelated not smooth and also the slight artifacting around the edges is more obvious on the higher resolution one but this rock and this foreground look way sharper. I did a, a load of different variety of tests like this, uh, comparing different qualities, qualities, file sizes, um, pixel sizes on the screen. But I also did that with print, as we will go into now. So here we have a variety of prints to look at. In our first test, we have a portrait of myself. All these pictures are exported from Capture One unless stated. Here we have three different pictures at different pixel amounts, different qualities, but all similar file sizes. They're all cropped in and zoomed in uh, to look the same. So which one looks better to you? If you really want to have a good look, best to pause the video if you want more time to study them before I give you the answers. So our conclusion about these three pictures here, well, to me, pixel amount makes a bigger difference than the quality slider does for the equivalent file size. In our second test, we have a wedding scene. We've got four different images, all printed at 5 by 7 inch, which for a wedding would be one of the most common sizes to print. They're all the same pixel size, but the difference is they're all different qualities, and also the file sizes would therefore be different. So for test two, with the wedding picture, our conclusion, well, for a small to medium sized print, it's really hard to tell the difference in the quality of the JPEG. Our third test is a landscape. We've got two images here, both printed at full size. One is at 0% JPEG quality from Capture One. The other is 100% quality. Our conclusion, well for me, for larger prints, there isn't a massive difference in perceptible quality, especially when you're viewing these large images at normal viewing distances. Test 4 is our landscape again, but this time zoomed in, we've got three images, all full size pixel amount, but zoomed and cropped in. They all have the, a similar file size, but all exported from different programs, so we've got Lightroom, Photoshop, and capture one here to compare. Our conclusion, well depending on which software you use, the quality slider has a different compression level applied to the image, so not all JPEGs are created equal. In this last test we're comparing four full-sized images, all zoomed in and cropped in, all exported from capture one, but with different quality settings and therefore file sizes as well. I won't tell you which one, but one is actually the original TIFF file, so really see if you can notice any difference here. So our conclusion for this last test, well between the original TIFF and 60% quality there's hardly any noticeable difference. The difference here really comes down to the file size. Uh, one interesting thing that I learned about JPEGs is that they can't uh, handle 
text very well at all. So what I did in Photoshop, I created a TIFF with a variety of text and different fonts and colours and, and sizes and a, and a nice gradient in the background. And then exported those with JPEGs of varying qualities. So here we go, here's, uh, here's the original TIFF, 200% and straight away on the on the 90% you can see artifacting around the edges edges 80% more and down to zero there which looks very terrible obviously exaggerated here because we're zooming in so far but you can you can see um, how edges just don't look very good with text the reason it does this I'm not going to explain the exact reason the way JPEG compresses images and data is what results in this. So it's just something to keep in mind. So there's a variety of color spaces. The most universally used one is sRGB. But those watching this may well have heard of uh, such ones as Adobe RGB, uh, which uh, some tout to, to be the one to use because it has a bigger color space than than sRGB and that is correct. So why don't we use Adobe RGB all the time then if it has a bigger color space? Well one of the reasons comes back to the fact that sRGB is universally accepted. It is the default color space for every monitor, screen and so forth. When it comes to displaying uh, that JPEG, if you use sRGB you know that it will, whatever browser you're using, whatever software, whatever program, that it will work and look like you know it should look. But another reason for using sRGB is to do with bit depth. So we're going to go into bit depth now. So you've got 8 bit, 16 bit, you got all the bits you want. So when you convert to JPEG, JPEG is an 8 bit image you don't have an option for 16 bit so because it's 8 bit you're limited in the amount of colors that you can have which is 256 but that's 256 colors for green for red and for blue the total amount of colors you have is there's nearly 17 million color variations that you can have side note even though we say 8 bit jpeg is actually a 24 bit color space because it's 8 bits for red, 8 bits for green, 8 bits for blue, so it's 24 bit. So whether you use sRGB or Adobe RGB, you still have that finite amount of color variations to, to cram all them colors into. So even though Adobe has a bigger color space, you still have to cram it into the same finite amount of 6 million color variation. So what happens with Adobe RGB, the colors are just spread out over a larger area which can then make things like banding a lot more obvious because you don't have the subtle variations in color tones anymore essentially it seems a bit pointless to use adobe rgb in that instance but say you're using a 16 bit file well then yeah adobe rgb pro photo all these other color spaces can then start to be utilized 16 bit which is actually a 48 true bit color has over 281 trillion color variations. So if you're editing, you want to stay within a 16-bit color space because you'll have so many more colors uh, to work with and that gives you so much more flexibility. But essentially, the most important point about using sRGB and its biggest uh, reason for using it is the fact that if you're printing, the color space of a printer is smaller than sRGB. There, there's no real benefit in keeping a JPEG in any color space other than sRGB. So on the point of printing, uh, let's talk about DPI. DPI refers to printing. How many dots per inch can the printer actually uh, print out? It's a bit different to PPI, which is to do with screen resolution, and it's how many pixels are in any given inch. So when it comes to PPI, for use with a screen it doesn't matter what the PPI is you've got a, a finite amount of pixels and if it's a thousand pixels long it's going to be displayed using a thousand pixels so it, it it doesn't matter whereas for printing DPI does matter so if you've got less dots per inch 
then that's going to actually cause a degradation in quality. Now, the kind of universal standard for DPI is 300. And, and when you export images from uh, Capture One, you'll notice that the resolution is automatically default at 300. What I noticed with Lightroom and Photoshop is that actually defaulted to 72 DPI, which when it comes to printing will make a difference. What you need to keep in mind is DPI or pixels an inch or dots per inch when exporting to a JPEG make zero difference in file size. You might as well just keep it at 300. It won't affect file size but it means if you wish to print it you have that extra resolution there. So this brings us round to my findings of my research if you wish to call it that and uh, what I suggest for using in different situations uh, for exporting uh, to JPEG. Let's start off with if you're editing a picture. Well if you're editing a picture you want to keep it in uh, a lossless format, ideally the original RAW file or if you need to uh, put the file into Photoshop to do a bit more work with it or do different things with it. You want to export in a lossless format like uh, TIFF or PSD or even PNG, but that's for another time. You want to keep it 16-bit. You can use a larger color space then like Adobe or Profoto and, and exporting in a larger color space actually gives you more flexibility, especially doing it at 16-bit. <laughs> Capture One, one thing I like to do is I like to export, well there's an option to export, so if I take this raw file, I can then come here, export images, originals, export the raw file into a separate file, so it basically copies the raw file, and it hit, you need to make sure this export as EIP is ticked, and what it will do, it will connect any adjustments you have made with that raw file so you can then later on open that raw file or keep that singular raw file somewhere else open it on a different version of Caption One on a different computer and it will have all your adjustments connected into that and linked into that raw file whilst keeping the original raw file which is a super handy thing <laughs> So what about other uses like for print, for web, for social media, all these kind of things? Well, basically a rule of thumb I would stick to is that a higher uh, pixel amount beats a higher quality in exporting to a JPEG. So for example, keeping that landscape image in full size but at 0% is better looking than perhaps half the amount of pixels but at 100%. Going into a bit more specific re recommendations, what about for social media, for web? Well, what I found there, for most screens, that about 2,000 pixels is kind of the sweet spot for a pixel amount at zero quality. You'll have some pretty small file sizes that mean websites are going to load quicker. You'll be, up, be able to upload to Instagram quicker and share with everyone your your ugly selfies. There are some instances though where you will be limited by the amount of pixels. You, you might want to be entering a contest and, it's, and it wants you to have a certain size image, say 3000 pixels. Well, what image quality setting do you use then? I found that about 50% will give you the best uh, ratio of quality to file size. What then about print? In fact I got some very nice prints. This image is actually printed at full resolution but 0% quality and it still looks really good. I can be really nitpicky about it but I would say that is still good enough quality but obviously if we're printing especially for personal use or if we want to you know you just want the best quality then really you need to print from the original RAW or a lossless TIFF or something like that. The printing from JPEG isn't the best. Okay then we move on to archiving. So you've got pictures that you've created, you've perhaps already printed them out but you, you obviously want to keep hold of them. So what's the best quality ratio to file size uh, that we can use? Because obviously you could keep, you can keep the raw, 
you can convert it to a TIFF and keep them, but they are very large. So for if you're just doing landscapes, perhaps, then you don't mind having the odd few pictures that are massive, that are lossless, uh, because with landscapes, quality of print does matter, and that's what we're interested in. That's why you bought that Sony A7R4 with 60 billion megapixels, so you, you could print at low quality, wasn't it? No, we want to print super high quality with landscapes. When it comes to things like weddings, where you've got a, a large amount of images, you, you want to reduce the hard disk space for all these hundreds of images that you, you want to store and back up. I found 70% to be the sweet spot between uh, good quality and a, a semi-decent decent file size. And on top of that, 70% uh, the use for like JPEG Mini becomes redundant. So there we go, That's, that is the journey of the JPEG. Hopefully them recommendations and a bit of knowledge to help you make better choices for exporting your JPEGs in the future. Let me know if this helped, because uh, I'd hate this research to have just gone to waste. Also, uh, if you have any extra information that you know that could help uh, me or anyone else about exporting JPEGs and things like that, it'd be uh, handy to know. So uh, you can write that in the comments. Also, on this journey, um, other file formats appeared. Obviously, we mentioned TIFF, DNGs, PNGs. We've got JPEG 2000, JPEG XR. Um, yeah, so... I looked into them and um, I'm hopefully going to bring a video about them to you soon. But uh, for now, enjoy your JPEG export sessions. Mmm. Ciao for now.